you remember this assignment that I gave to you? That you would remember these three terms and try them out? How many of you try them out? Come on, come on. Some, that's a very, very poor percentage. I, th I think it was less than 10%. I'm pretty sure about that. So I'm going to reassign it this time, okay? And this time I want you to report with, to someone at your table next week about your experience with using these. That'll make a little accountability. You see how that works there? So I want you to actually next week then report to one another your experience and experiments with this method. Because when you're talking with someone, I want you to actually be using this when you're talking with them. You can always say, I'm going to trust trusting the Father, abiding in the Son, walking by the Spirit. Can't you? You know you can. And when you're driving, try it when you're driving. Try it at different times of the day. When you take out the trash. Uh, try it uh, in annoying times. You see? And so I want you then to try it this week. Trust the Father, abide in the Son, walk by the Spirit throughout the course of your day. And then report back to one another next week at your, at your table. You all agree? I, don't, I, just, I, see, I feel a... Are they a stiff-necked and rebellious people? I'm not quite sure. I always love that phrase in the Old Testament. You are a stiff-necked and rebellious people. So there we have it. Also, I wanted to make an announcement that um, in addition to this paperback handbook to prayer, which some of you have, um, this just came out, and it's, it's, it's a big boy. It's 712 pages, but it's Handbook to God's Promises. So this is part of a series that uh, is a nine handbook series. And when we were about to do the It in Bonded Leather as well, and then all three, all nine will be available in both uh, paperback and bonded leather. So um, if this is a powerful resource for what are God's promises concerning various aspects of our lives. Promises about God's principles, about his presence, about uh, his provision in our life. Um, his protection over you, his plan for you, and his preparation of your life. You see that? So these are perhaps practical things each day. It's a 52-day deal. That's what it is. It's a, so that's what I'm uh, recommending there as a new, new resource for you. Now we're going to pick up where we left off. And remember, we've been doing a, I'm doing a very, very truncated version of a longer series I'm doing on my Sunday evening, uh, my, my, my rather, it was my Sunday morning class, but I've switched it. It's going to be my Monday night class. Crazy story there. But um, in, these, in these weekly studies, though, I've been doing this whole theme of wisdom on, on that was uh, found now in the Sunday morning study archive. And it encompassed a lot of things. It's one of these things, you know how you work on a project, it has a life of its own. You ever have that kind of experience, you know? And wait, this is, and you, this, and you can't get there till you see this. And the only way you can see this insight is to have done this, this, and this. And you know how that works in life. So this thing kept growing. And it was, this short thing turned out to be a seven part series. And I'm only up to part uh, three. So, uh, but I'm enjoying that. With you, I'm gonna go much, much quicker than that. So I'm not going to take all your time on that. But I want to do a very brief introduction to wisdom. And I have a document that I'm going to be using, walking you through. You'll see it. And I'm going to give it to you so you don't need to take notes from this document. You see, it'll be yours. Um, we'll have to, Dennis, we'll, let me provide that document for you that you can send to everybody. And we can make that available, uh, Jake, on, online as, in, as well. That way you can follow that. And it's, it's an unedited, I, I kind of passed through this thing. It was actually a transcription I did on a series on, so, on Proverbs many years ago. And it was a seven part series that I did. And it, it kind of evolved. And so I turned it into a, tra a transcription. I kind of worked through it one time. It's not edited by one of my editors, but it's, it's better than it was before, I can promise you that. So I want to walk you through then an introduction to wisdom by looking at that document, which is my overview of the book of Proverbs, you see. So the practical wisdom of Proverbs, and I'm going to make it large like this so you can see where I am. Does that make sense? So let's, let's walk our way through there. Um, and so there's this whole idea then of it re involves intellectual, not so much intellectual perception, but moral excellence. You see the difference? We're not talking about whether you're smart or not. We're talking about whether you have character or not. 
You see the issue here? So it's not a question of real, um, the issue of, of intelligence, but really there are a lot of smart fools, you see. Um, and, but really it's a matter of practical application. So, in the, so that you have the concept here, let me, as I put it here, depending upon God on the one hand versus autonomous living on the other, it comes down to that. And everything comes from him. Everything you love, what do you love? Do you love things that are beautiful, that are good, that are true? Do you love those things? Who made them? We didn't make them. If you see any goodness, beauty, and truth, and if you see it through a person, that's because he made that person and gave him the capacity for beauty, goodness, and truth, because we're made in his image. So because of beauty, we are aesthetic beings. Because of goodness, we're moral beings. And because of truth, we're rational beings. And so it goes. So the one who made it all is the one you're to pursue. It'd be a fool's errand to pursue any lesser good than the wellspring of all that we love and know. Be a fool to do that, but so many people follow that, and that's the folly of the, of the uh, book of Proverbs versus the, uh, in terms of the folly and the wisdom. So it's been said, a wise man learns from the mistakes of others. Nobody lives long enough to make them all himself. And I think there's truth in that. And that's why one of the things you wanna do in the book of Proverbs, you'll notice there are nine chapters preparing the student, the son, my son, if you will only listen, my son, my son, here's the, I know there's a price, but here's why it's worth it. You see the idea? And he compares it, it's a brilliant thing. Like these nine chapters, 10 little sermonettes to the son. And he's preparing him for the reception of the wisdom that begins in chapter 10 because that's when the Psalm Proverbs actually begin. So what's the, what's the point of this? It's not just to live and learn. You're gonna do that. But you also, can we learn and live? Is it possible for us to learn from uh, the wisdom of others rather than making all the mistakes ourselves? And that's the concept here. So the ra reality is that, um, uh, that we, the old phrase, we grow too soon old and too late smart that phrase, you see. Youth is wasted on the young, that sort of a thing. But you really, uh, you want to say, couldn't I, what if I could take it back? How many times have you had done something really stupid you sh and that you, you didn't do well and you want to unplay that? But you can't take it back um, because all, it took all your years. And you, have you ever had this experience when you yourself spoke to your younger self and said, why did you do that? That stupid thing that you did? It's a scene of, about that um, in, in uh, the Shawshank Redemption, where he says, I, not a day goes by where I don't tell that young man, don't do this. But you see, there's some things you have to learn through hardship before you're ready to receive the lesson. You could never do it because it took all those years to acquire what you have, a lifetime to gain real skill in the art of living. And so it's learn and live then. And we're talking about the fact that it's so intriguing in our time. How much wisdom is there in our culture, in our time, when there is not even any common sense left over, and people are not making their, their uh, based, they're not basing their opinions and their views largely on evidence or reason, but on the memes of social media and, uh, the, and, and all those kinds of things where they're not independently thinking and learning from themselves. So how much wisdom? that you have, there's a student at, a, at Columbia University who complained because the brochure said it was gonna uh, teach wisdom, and at the end of his time there, he said, I didn't learn any wisdom here, so he tried to sue the college. Now, that's not gonna work, but the fact is, you're not gonna learn wisdom. In fact, uh, Jordan Peterson, I kind of agree with him, when somebody comes up with something ex especially stupid, I mean, exquisitely stupid, then he asked the question, what graduate school did you go to? You, you can't even get this an undergraduate. You've got to be educated that much to be that imbecilic. You're educated into imbecility. You go beyond wisdom in that. And so um, my father had, and wisdom, you know, is uneven, as I've told you before. There are some people who have real shrewdness and wisdom in one area of their life, and in another area, they're complete fools. Do you know what I'm talking about? Nobody is perfectly rounded out. We all have those areas. 
My father, one of his areas of wisdom was that he was an ex ex extraordinary driver. He was a bus driver. And for over 40 years, he took the red and tan lines from North Jersey to, to Manhattan at, at, at basically um, Grand Central. And, and he would go, would go back in the, um, it's not Grand Central, what was it? Um, Port Authority, Port Authority. And he would go there and back and back and back. Over 40 years he did this. The man never had an accident. When you think about that, that's pretty impressive, you see. And I remember how daunting it was for, for me to learn to drive under his tutelage because it was horrendous that first day because I knew his standards were so great. You see, the pressure was very, very high. The guy was skillful. And so I disappointed him. But eventually, you see, I did pick up some wisdom for him. Give me, let me give you an example. He said, son, I don't never drive by the car in front of you, but always look in front of him. Don't base your, your decisions upon the guy just in front of him. Look ahead and draw conclusions. How many times do you see you're perhaps on a four lane road and somebody gets caught and you know what's gonna happen, but you avoid that, you avert it because you see the patterns up ahead, don't you? And so you already are prepared to be in the, this lane instead of the one you, the others are getting caught in. It's a matter of driving ahead. So he said, look at the, when someone breaks and it starts coming to you, it happened. So when I was in Manhattan, and I was going to go from uh, Lower Manhattan to, the, to Brooklyn. I took the Brooklyn Battery uh, Tunnel. And it was this particular, this, there are a couple of ones, but this one was just one lane that way, one lane that way. Is that simple? And I'm, uh, then I'm, I'm driving along, and way off in the distance, I see some red lights. Way off. And they're slowly, they're starting to come toward me. Way off, though. Immediately, I start, I hit my brakes, slowly. But try to, the guy behind me must have thought I was a madman. I'm pumping it so that he's not going to hit me, but I'm still slowing down as fast as I can to keep him from hitting me. And here's why. Because by the time I stopped the car, the car, two cars in front of me had actually been, actually the car in front of me was in the accident. It stretched back all the way here. So I averted the accident by stopping earlier. I'm, the guy who hated me, I'm sure, who was behind me, must have loved me. So when the accident occurred, I just did a U-turn and drove out of the tunnel, averting now many hours of grief and trouble. So the issue is then um, courses on wisdom. Then you have to you have this idea of how much uh, how much space there was. Then uh, let me find you a little thing here. So how long do your brakes last? This is one of the evidences. You see, the, if you're a skillful driver, your brakes will last longer than one who's not skillful, who's always pumping them and doing this, that, and the other. So there's a certain ma measure of wisdom that you can uh, gain, a certain acuity that could be in anything. And one of the great things is this a mark of greatness to admit our mistakes and our sins, to deal with them, re repent of them. But the best way to turn from both our errors and our sins is before we commit them. So this is the whole idea. You've got to anticipate certain issues. Every happening, Malcolm Muggeridge wrote, great and small is a parable whereby God speaks to us and the art of life is to get the message. So that's what he's saying, the art of living well. But you know there are some people who have 30 years of experience and they've lived the same year 30 times. You see, it's not a matter of experience, it's application. So they can be, there's no fool like an old fool. And there's no saint like an old saint. It goes both ways, doesn't it? So in, in considering this then, I think it's wisdom then. Experience is valuable, but only when you apply it. And so we learn from the school of failure more than we learn from the school of success. We know this. I hate that. Don't you wish that weren't true? We live in a world where things are upside down. I was just looking at those pastries in the, in the uh, coffee shop this morning. And I, I told her, wouldn't it be lovely if these things were actually good for you? Why is it that the worse a thing tastes, the better it is for me? This is a fallen world. I'm co confident that in the resurrection body, we'll be fine. But that's another matter. Um, so don't want to repeat the same blunders again. And these principles that we're talking about are timeless. These prover proverbs are as relevant today as when they were there 3,000 years ago. They're timeless truth, and there's wisdom. For example, wisdom 
that's only been recently recovered about principles about skillful li listening. For example, there's a lot in, about, in Proverbs about relation, about, about communication, about listening. And it's there. And only recently <clears throat> have, it, have we been uncovering some of these implications. And so um, we're talking about Hebrew poetry. And it's, um, the, the Hebrew word mashal for proverb is a word that means a comparison. It means, let's compare this with that. And it could be antithetical. So you have first one theme and then the opposite. Or it can be synonymous. You have one line and then the next line establish, embellishes it. A just balance and scales belong to the Lord. All the weights of the bag are his concern. You see, it's synonymous. He just said the same thing in two different ways. And Hebrew poetry beautifully rhymes ideas, not sounds. And the concepts, it's very sophisticated in many ways. And so it's, it's telling, telling us certain uh, in, implications and ideas of, of Proverbs and so forth. And the Greek, the, the Hebrew word for wisdom, chokhma, is a word that means skill. One of the main reason, me, meanings of that word is skill in the art of living. I remember I gave you a little list of these metaphors and all the different things that li wisdom can be. What you remember, how would you describe it? If you were to say, what terms are used in the scriptures for a wise living? What, I'll give you a, a one, prudence. Give me another. So wisdom, prudence, okay, discernment, understanding, you see, knowledge, discretion. You see, those are t terms, they're all layering because there's no one word that'll summarize this gem we're talking about. It has many facets of wisdom. And your desire and God's desire for you is that you become a beautiful, multifaceted gem where the raw material now has been actually faceted in such a way that you begin to reflect the glory of God, but in a way that no one else can do. You're unique. And there's that wonderful thought. And so it's, it's much more than just mere intelligence, as I was saying before. So Proverbs 1.7 um, is one of those verses that when we look up, we see that this is one of the bases of, of wisdom. So um, here we go, Proverbs 1 and verse 7. And so it tells us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, which means the word beginning can be the foundation of knowledge, you see. It's that upon which knowledge is built. So knowledge is one of those words for wisdom, as I said before. And I mentioned this, and I'll just re 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 refer you to this. Um, when we think about wisdom, here are some of those words I had in mind. Skill, fear of the Lord, discernment, un knowledge, prudence, understanding, discretion, instruction, insight, righteousness, equity, justice, learning, counsel, reproof, truth, goodness, beauty, nobility, humility, obedience, and rightness. These are images, it's a rich uh, picture. And so he's telling us then that in this idea of Proverbs 1.7, that's a key verse, but also 9.10 amplifies that. If the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, then if you go to Proverbs in, nine, in chapter nine and verse uh, 10, you'll see the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, of skill, of, lo of life. You are raw material when you're born. You're precious, you have great value, but like um, gold ore, what, hap what happens with that ore? You're raw, you're not, not shaped, it has to be what? It has to be go through the furnace. It has to be uh, uh, purified, you see. And training also is involved. So you learn skill by training and by habituation. How do you become a skillful um, baseball player or golfer? How do you become a skillful pianist? How do you learn a language? Just by training and be willing to make blunders, but you still learn from it until, again, you continue to become more skillful. Same thing here, so that through instruction, then. Instruction is the key to this whole thing. Discipline, because it needs to be shaped and molded according to the right context. And that's why the family is a laboratory for life. And that's why the culture is challenging God's laboratory, God's basis for actual impartation in transgenerational ways of wisdom that goes beyond this. <clears throat> so the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And then there's also Psalm 111.10, because this is also uh, a verse that relates to this wisdom. And so Psalm 
what did I say, 111.10? Yeah, I think that was it. And so we have verse 10 here. The fear of the Lord is the beginning. Again, all, all three, it's the foundation. A good understanding of all those who do his commandments, his praise endures forever. So the point that I'm raising here is that this is something that has to do with something powerful, raw, but beautiful, but needs to be shaped and ordered. And so we have to gain God's perspective and long-term wisdom then is what life is about, to gain the long-term perspective rather than the short-term. Um, so as I say, uh, the word instruction, musar, means discipline. It gives you skill. So you don't gain skill without practice. And you don't actually become successful until you make a lot of mistakes. But you have to be willing, to, but not just to blow up at the mistakes. What are you supposed to do? You learn from it. Don't beat yourself up. Okay, I get it this time. And you learn from it instead of being uh, chiding yourself. You're raw and you have to, like Bezalel and Aholiab who made the temple, a uh, tabernacle rather. They took raw materials and shaped it and ordered it. So you and I need to be shaped and ordered and disciplined. That means that you need to be brought under the tutelage and the discipline of the word of God. And so we're talking about knowledge that's applied in the rough and tumble of life. We're not just talking about theoretical stuff, but we're talking about what does that look like in negotiation? What does it look like in making a decision, another business decision, in looking at a contract. What does it look like in uh, talking with my neighbor? Do you see what I'm saying? Each thing you have to adapt through wisdom and gain that in, in, insight and understanding. So the whole goal is to achieve success as God would define it, rather than you and I. And that's a hard one for us because the world tells us success looks like this. And usually it's gonna be possessions or position or prestige, or popularity, or power, or, or uh, possessions. Did I mention that? Because we keep going back to that, don't we? We keep going back to trying to define ourselves and our worth. We say, what's he worth? As if your worth could be based upon some um, account, some statement of your financial affairs. No, you, a man's life does not consist in the, in the abundance of his possessions, as our Lord told us. And so we see these things here. You want to create, so what you want to have is you want to have a create, create a taste for the subject where you separate the elderly from the young is another one of these things that I mentioned here because it's sad to me that the, uh, in previous cultures, the elders were in positions of esteem. And in those days and in other cultures, it would be the wise who would be close to the fire and telling the stories and the narratives. And then further out, as they got a little bit younger, and then the youth would be further out from the fire, the furthest out. So the sage is telling stories in front of the fire. He's narrating, he's relating, he's conveying, he's transgenerationally influencing, and it's gone. We virtually lost that in, the last, in our lifetimes in many ways because we've now relegated the, the elderly, the wise, the, those who could have had, we, we, we remove them in many cases, and we don't have that transgenerational esteem, and, and they're re not regarded with, with that as well. So this is a, um, a, a, view, a view then that I think is very critical for us to see. One other thing, um, a proverb can be decide, def defined as a simple illustration that exposes a fundamental reality about life, and that's, that's the concept there. So a stitch in, in, in time saves nine. Simple proverb, what does it mean? Anticipate, you see. Instead of just reacting, you're being proactive. There's a wisdom in that simple, uh, homely kind of uh, proverb, but it's pithy, it's insightful, it can be remembered. And so these are just certain thoughts that I had for you that I wanted you to, uh, to hear in terms of this wisdom that God has for us, his desire for us is to actually uh, grow in wisdom. So the question I want to ask you is how can you grow in wisdom? What ways, what areas, and I want you to ask you yourselves this question as well. Where, where do you have wisdom, do you think, and where do you have, where, you, where are you incomplete, you see? Is there some areas in your life that are not consistent and others that are? It's amazing we can be wise in one, one sphere and very foolish in another. But so, and then Proverbs 9, 10, what does it mean for, uh, to you and for you? And so that was the text I was reading to you before. And I want you to think about this question as to the role of discipline in the acquisition of wisdom 
And look at the discipline that you incurred when you were a child and the discipline, if you have children, that, that you have uh, sought to uh, create in such a way that it's, it's speaking the truth in love and that it is, in fact, it is a discipline, but it's a loving discipline, it's a graceful, so that you have a right balance in, in, the, in, that, in that mindset. It's very hard uh, for us to get that kind of wisdom. So I'm gonna give you some time then to uh, interact together and um, process these questions. And then we'll, get, we'll meet in a few minutes and go over them, okay? Let's go now to these questions, but open it up to uh, any thoughts, insights you might have that you'd like us to explore in our, our time together. So um, what insight did you gain from your discussion about any of these three questions? We'll just let, let you have at it. Well, I think we all have 24 hours a day. Yeah, we all have the same amount of time. And we have to choose how we use it. Mm -hmm. It's about discipline. Yes. So the question is, we're all given the same amount of time, so it's a question of how, as a steward, you invested it, because you're not on your own time, as you know. A steward always manages the possessions of another. That includes not only your skills, your talent, but also your time, as well as your wealth, as well as your understanding of truth, as well as relationships. Those five areas of stewardship, there are others, but those are the primary ones. So we always say time, talent, and treasure, and it's so, but really, was what was I doing? Was I investing my time, talent, and treasure by transmuting it from the lead of the, of the temporal into the gold of the eternal by building truth into eternal beings? It gets back to ROI. It gets back to ROI. Yes, yes. And wisdom then tells us to pursue and treasure the unseen over the seen. Wisdom tells us then to pursue that which is going to last. And that's the temporal versus the eternal perspective. Um, I discovered when I was working for an organization, the first organization after seminary. I graduated from Dallas Seminary in 72. And so in, I lived in Knoxville, Tennessee from 1972 to 75. And I was working for an organization with an organization called New Life. And it was sort of like Young Life, but for adults. And a lawyer, very clever fellow, very bright, uh, very skillful, basically noticed, because he loved evangelism, and he kind of developed a thing which he called lifestyle or friendship evangelism, and he's ahead of the curve in that, at that time, because that became a whole movement, you see. Um, and he, they were, he realized that there were basically variations of 12 basic questions that people always <clears throat> ask about, about this, this whole area of, uh, of, of objections to the faith. There are always variations and combinations of that. But the whole idea, though, of realizing that wisdom is so critical. I, I, I look at those days and did a lot of stupid things, but it's all training, you see. So I went back to that period. But I, one of the things, I, I, I reason I mentioned it is because there was a uh, New Life newsletter, and I, I see if I can find it for you, that um, I just discovered here. Um, Let's see if I can find, yeah, it's this news life, New Life newsletter. And so I did these articles. I totally forgot about this, you see, the deity of Christ. So this, is back, this is back in May of 75 here. And I discovered this is the first time right here is when I wrote on this, Knoxville, Tennessee, June of 75, developing an eternal perspective, you see. So, and we, so I discovered this and then had, it all, had a PDF made of all these teaching letters because a lot of them are still pretty evergreen. So that's when I started with that, an eternal perspective. And I must tell you, I came up, I came with the, up with a conviction that though people say Jesus spoke more about money and wealth than anything else, that's not the case. Money and wealth was an illustration of the temporal versus the eternal. That's what it was. It wasn't money as such, but in, uh, where a man's possessions, where his heart is, that's where his treasure. And so it's an illustration of that. So that's been, I think it's been a motif throughout the, my, the course of my life, is this, this wisdom. Because the wisest thing you can do is to treat things according to their true value. The stupidest thing you can do is treat the temporal as if it's gonna go forever. And the eternal, I can deal with that when, I, when I'm older. 
And then like a frog in the kettle, after a while, you're older, but you don't even have the, the capacity. You become so apathetic, enervated, that you can't even do it anymore. You see the point? What you decide today will matter tomorrow. And so you have to, the person you're going to become in five years is going to be shaped by the person you are now. And you have to make that recalibration. We've just come up, by the way, with a, a guide to how to do such a recalibration, which I want to share with you. Remind me to do this. It's how to have an annual retreat with God, one just with him, and how you spend the, each of the hours and do it. It would be life transforming if you do it, because we need to recalibrate and revisit, or you're just going to keep on repeating the same blunders again and again. So this eternal perspective. So the wisest wisdom is to treat things according to the true value. Folly, then, is to miss the point and esteem those things which are passing away. And sadly, this is what most people do. As we've seen m multiple times before, um, the uh, seven uh, Ps that you've got here are what people live for and die with, they suppose, but they leave it all behind. Every bit of that they leave behind, every bit. They have nothing that they take with them when they do this. Now, we're all a bit of a, an amalgam. Some things we do in the flesh, some things we do in the spirit. And you'd like to become more spirit-led. Uh, you'd like to become more spring-led to the things of the spirit. But you learn from these things. And this life is a soul-forming world, as you know. And you're, you're, you're training in wisdom, in the wisdom of becoming more and more in your day-by-day -day choices, desires, activities, treatment of people. You're becoming more and more there who you already are in the heavenly places. Never perfect, but you're becoming. And it's going to involve trials and adversities. And the shape by suffering motif that we've talked about is a part of that journey. So it's something that wisdom tells us that um, we need to treasure those things that matter. Because here I always say, this is what we really want. But not a one of those will bring them. Not one of those. Not by themselves, you see. Because you see, um, we suppose that'll happen. The love, joy, and peace is a product. It's the byproduct of the overflow of the pursuit of God above all else. That's where this wisdom comes. Any thoughts? Oh, let's go back to this little, this little deal we had here before. Go back to that and go back to this guy here. Thoughts? What, else, what uh, insight did you get at your, one of your tables? Yeah. Yeah. I'll repeat your question. Yeah. So we're talking about the concerns that we have with our children, the educational issues as well, and then how can we what? How, how we can be able to propagate propagate truth. Yeah. You've got to, as 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 a person, you have to um, become seek to become uh, so other centered that you become winsome. You see. When it becomes something where, where, that you're really on their team and not on their back is a really huge issue. So you will be able to, to teach and train, but you have to use some honey in that, you see. You train them with that. And you give them something that is a good thing instead of just something negative. And so there's got to be some enhancement. And the child needs the masculine soul, and they're de deprived of that when that occurs without that. This whole rage is the loss of three fathers that we've been seeing. The loss of the father, the earthly father, the loss of the father with a capital F, and the loss of the fatherland, the patria. You see, those three things have greatly diminished. And as a consequence, people are alienated and en enraged and somehow feel that this isn't fair. And so it, so it goes. So for me, then, to go against that current is to forge, at least as best as I'm capable of doing, a loving relationship and being more centered around the child. Now, you can only go so far because they'll only allow you to know them as much as they want to. So you might be, find that limited. And sometimes that occurs and it's painful to me as a grandfather when I see those things occurring. So I there have to, I hold them before God because how do I know what's best for that child? Maybe they have to go through this thing in order for them to gain the awful price of wisdom. I don't know. 
but there I have to be available. So you can always do these three things. As a father or as a grandfather, you can uh, certainly pray for your children and you can love them and serve them. And you have to find creative ways, but it's also going to be according to their ways because the same thing with one person will not be effective with another. So you have to be a student of your child and know that to train up each child according to his what? His way, because each is unique. So one person will require a firmer hand, another one re really requires more encouragement, and so it goes. So that's wisdom, is adapting and learning. And that's how you do it with your, um, in, your, in your relationships in this world as well, that there's a give and a take, and there's, you, instead of seeing life as so much of the world does as a zero-sum game. A biblical view of life is never a zero-sum game. It's a win-win when you seek. What's well, the well being of others, it becomes a thing. We all win, we all become beneficial. And that's what I want for us as well that your life will matter, that you become a skillful person at what you are uniquely called to do and no one else can do. You're, you were born at this, this time, um, a remarkable time in history. You've seen more transformation, most of you, than the world's ever known in one lifetime. Going from basically in an analog world to a digital world, unless you're a little bit younger. But basically, you have that. And more than that, and yet you were here for such a time as this, and he's determined your time that you're going to be on this, the number of your days, and he put you in a certain place, and he gave you certain influences. He's given you a sphere of influence, and now he's going to hold you accountable as a steward for what did you do with the time I gave you, with the talents I gave you, and with the treasure I gave you. You see the idea? What did you do will be, I think, a question at the bema, the judgment seat of God, of Christ. So you're not only a steward of managing the affairs of another, but you're an ambassador, um, ma managing the possession, but you're an ambassador managing the affairs of another. You're in the king's business. You're not even, your life is not your own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, you're in his business and you're managing his affairs. And that is a wise way to live, live with the eternal in mind.